Hello, and welcome uh, to the Historical Society's uh, virtual open house weekend event. I'm Janine Fallon Maurer. I'm the president of the Historical Society. And on behalf of um, the HSW, as we refer to ourselves, I would like to welcome everyone to the presentation of Toby Carey's latest document, documentary, Mountain River, the Esopus Creek Headwaters to the Hudson. The Historical Society of Woodstock is an all volunteer member supported 501c3 organization. Traditionally, we have a very popular holiday open house this weekend, which features a holiday themed exhibit and presentations. This is also the weekend when our gift shop has a great number of visitors, resulting in a very successful fundraising weekend for the Historical Society. As many other nonprofits we have, have done during the pandemic, we have launched a virtual um, online gift shop. So we'll invite you to check that out over the weekend. Mountain River, the Esopus Creek Headwaters to the Hudson is available for sale through our gift shop, as well as other select books and note cards. We're especially happy to say that we are able to have our town historian Richard Hepner's latest publication, Woodstock's infamous murder trial, racial injustice in upstate New York available for sale, as well as our newly republished book, From Sunset to Cox Crow by Neva Schultes. I have put into the chat our website info and I will put in the contact of Debbie, our gift shop manager, for those of you who are interested in engaging some virtual shopping over the weekend. We will have a Q&A after the presentation. Please send your questions through the chat function and I will ask Toby the questions at the end of the presentation. All mics will be muted during this event. And at this time, Weston, I would turn over the presentation to Weston Blaylock, who's one of our event organizers. And thank you again for being here. Okay, thank you, uh, Janine. Uh, Toby Carey is a sterling uh, documentary filmmaker here in the Hudson Valley. Uh, he has many outstanding titles to his credit. They include Deep Water, the Catskill Mountain House, Rails to the Catskills, Sweet Violets, The First Artist in America. All of these are perennial bestsellers. And so it augurs well that he's come up with another one out of his bag of tricks. Uh, tonight's presentation, as Janine has said, features his latest documentary, Mountain River, the Esopus Creek Headwaters to the Hudson. It's a feature length film, includes many rare stills, expert commentary and lively soundtrack. All of these are hallmarks of a uh, Toby Carey production. Uh, Toby's films retail typically for $19.95 and all of the titles are available in our gift shop. So welcome, Toby. Thank you. Thank you. Nice to be here with you all. Thanks for joining in. Uh, I want to let you all know that uh, Mark Lodi is with us. And he is the uh, one of my the co-producer on this film, uh, and I'll just give you a little background on on uh, me and on our organization, which is called Willow Mixed Media. We've been doing a variety of arts projects and documentaries since the early 1970s. Weston mentioned some of the full-length documentaries that we've produced, starting with Deep Water, which is now going to be in 2000, in 2021, we'll have its 20th year anniversary. So we're very pleased that it's been around for that long and people seem to still find it anew and enjoy it. Uh, so uh, that's part of what we have done over the years. We have also done a lot of contract work for environmental organizations like Clearwater and uh, for school systems, for uh, for indi individual artists and working with, with uh, a, a wide variety of people in the community. So it's been, uh, for me, uh, 50 years of making films uh, of a variety of uh, kinds, lately concentrating quite a bit on these historical uh, documentaries about the Catskills and the Hudson Valley. So um, my wife, who, Meg, who some of you know is been my co-producer on many of these uh, projects. And she suggested it might be a beautiful looking film to do something about trout fishing on the Esopus. So that was the genesis of the 
film. It quickly kind of uh, blossomed beyond that and mushroomed into a, a broader look at the Esopus, not just about the fishing aspect of it. Uh, and I was fortunate that Mark Lodi would, was joining the project. Uh, Mark is a noted photographer and a licensed fishing guide in the Catskills. So who better to turn to than to uh, than Mark to tell the story of the Upper Esopus and uh, then to discover along with him the rest of the creek, which is really uh, a learning process for all of us. So, uh, Mark, I don't know if you want to chime in here on some of the beginnings of the film. Yeah, um, Toby mentioned he's been making these films for 50 years. This was a five year project out of his uh, historic uh, filmic life. Um, it was truly a labor of love. Um, we financed this on our own dime. As Toby mentioned, I am a professional fly fishing guide, so I have extensive uh, contacts in the angling community. But one of the things that attracted me to the project is this, this place we live, Woodstock, I'm in Chichester, is right smack dab in the middle of the cradle of American fly fishing, the birthplace of American fly fishing, the charm circle of American fly fishing. So it was an extremely rich historical topic uh, from which to draw upon. And uh, we have a wide selection of various anglers, historians, uh, people to tell that side of the story. But as Toby mentioned, as we got deeper and deeper into that story, we realized that uh, that was really kind of the tip of the iceberg. And there was so much more history, so much more culture, uh, so much more geology, geography uh, that we wanted to bring up and wanted to cover. So it really blossomed in, into what, at least part of what you will see in the clips we're offering. But um, what we found out was the the history of our area is so much richer than uh either Toby and I had uh, imagined to set out to Chronicle. So it, it really kind of, uh, the project kind of ran away with itself, thankfully, thankfully. And, uh, and thankfully under Toby's guidance, we were able to, uh, to herd these cats into a, you know, what I think is a pretty cohesive, coherent story of the history of the Esopus Creek. Good, well, thanks, Mark. Um, I have a, selected a few clips to show, perhaps we'll start with the showing one, which is, happens in the beginning of the of the film, it's kind of an introduction to the geology of what made the Esopus Creek uh, what it is. Uh, so, if I can share my screen, we'll see if that works. Uh, we'll watch a short clip, and then we can come back, uh, maybe uh, talk some more about it. Let's see how this works. We know we can get there. Let's see here. Share your screen, Top. Gonna try. Here you go. So here's the um, the first clip here. We can make this full screen. Hope this works well. Sound, Toby. Drained into a vast river plain that then went into a shallow sea. The Catskill rocks represent that river plain. The Catskill Delta is estimated to be about four to five miles thick of rock and representing here about 20 million years. Six million years of that is represented in the Esopus watershed. These sandstones represent an ancient river deposit. And we know the age of the rock based upon its position relative to all the other rocks around here. And it's Devonian. The Devonian represents a time 380 to 400 million years ago, that we had this ancient river environment that was capable of laying down all of this sand. So the red beds in the Catskills, they represent the ancient Devonian floodplains. Like where these guys are right now up on that slope over there, they might be on a former floodplain. So this is out of the river, this is in the river. So that's a, a, brief, a brief clip uh, from the geology section uh, and Danny Davis who you saw there 
uh, continues uh, to enlighten us throughout it. Um, we talk about turbidity and the cause of the turbidity. Uh, and I'll let Mark talk about that a little bit because it impacts the uh, the fishing uh, aspect of the upper surface so greatly. Uh, Mark, if, if you'd like to. Yeah, as a matter of fact, I live on the, uh, the Stony Clove tributary of the Sopus Creek. By the way, there was, uh, we should identify Danny Davis as the uh, New York City Department of Environmental Preservation uh, uh, hydrogeomorphologist for the Osopus uh, Creek uh, drainage. He's been working on um, on this drainage uh, ever since I've been here for like the last 20 years, probably one of the most knowledgeable hydrogeomorphologists in the country. And um, also this system is one of the most studied river systems in the country because it supplies uh, 40 to 45% of New York City's drinking water. And of course, uh, New York City doesn't want a lot of turbidity in their drinking water. <clears throat> uh, so they need cool, clear water, which it turns out is exactly what the trout need to, to thrive and survive. But uh, the tributary I live on, the Stony Clove Creek is really the poster boy. Uh, before uh, Danny and the uh, DEP minions uh, got involved, the, uh, the Stony Clove Creek was responsible for 30 to 35% of the turbidity going into the Esopus Creek, which would then go into the Ashokan Reservoir, which supplies 40 to 45% of New York City's drinking water. Um, so that was a serious issue. The uh, Federal Environmental Protection Agency uh, said that New York City could maintain their filtration avoidance determination if they cleaned up the Esopus Creek. So New York City is one of five municipalities in the country that is allowed to deliver their water unfiltered. Uh, and that's a testament to how pure these, these Catskill waters are. The other municipalities, by the way, are Boston, San Francisco, uh, Syracuse, and Portland. And of course, New York City. Uh, New York City's freshwater supply system is considered uh, one of the best, cleanest groundwater municipal supply systems on the planet. People come from all over the world to study it. But that's based on the premise that we keep these Catskill waters clean, fresh, and pure. So um, New York City uh, has, uh, in lieu of creating a filtration plant somewhere in New York City to the tune of many, many billions of dollars of uh, uh, maintenance and operation, they elect to spend the millions of dollars uh, in this watershed to keep this water clean. Um, and as I mentioned, the uh, Sopus Creek is, uh, rather the Stony Clove is a poster boy. Um, the figures keep varying from New York City, but uh, they've literally spent millions of dollars, in some cases, totally re-engineering uh, the mountain slopes in this, in this valley, in the uh, Stony Clove Valley. And within the last three or four years, the uh, water has flown way more pure. Typically in these uh, very heavy rain events, such as we had two days ago, three days ago, um, the river would turn chocolate milk and that would in turn turn the Asopus Creek chocolate milk, go into the Ashokan Reservoir. That was a big problem. That's no longer happening. And coincidentally for the angling enthusiasts amongst us, that once they cleared up the turbidity in the Stony Clove Creek, the uh, trout fishing improved tremendously. The importance of that is that these uh, smaller tributaries are basically the nurseries for our, our trout. Uh, they are where the trout swim up to spawn uh, in, their, in their spawning period. And this is where the baby trout are born and grow up to be the big trout that we love to catch. So it's all connected, the turbidity, the geography, the geology. Um, but things are improving thanks to um, New York City's commitment and involvement uh, specifically to maintain their filtration avoidance determination. Good, thanks Mark. That's a lot of great detail. Um, I'm sure a lot of people didn't know much of that before, but um, that's great. So one of the other things that we did in the film was not only uh, deal with uh, the, the adults in the, in the, in the creek uh, watershed, but we covered the Trout Unlimited program, uh, which is called Trout in the Classroom. And it so happens that Mark is president of the local Ashokan Papacton chapter, so he wears another hat in that. Uh, but we have a short clip that shows the Trout in the Classroom uh, operation in the Phoenician School, where it's been in place for many, many years. Maybe some of you here have went to the Phoenician School and had the opportunity to uh, to partake in it. So let's see if we can see that one as well. Mm -hmm. 
back to the right place here. And here we go. Trap in the Classroom is meant to educate the youngsters, teach them about the environment, and by them learning that we have to have a clean tank and the fish have to have a place to live, we hope they take that out when they're grown up and look in the stream and say, we want this clean, we want our whole environment clean. And it depends on the very first things that start, which is what we do with the eggs. And then we, they grow up and they grow up and then when they're released, we want them released in the wilderness and we want them to be able to live a long time. There you go. So that's that's another short clip. Um, I have to tell you, we have about a uh, a dozen chapters, if you will, uh, in the film, uh, which runs seventy three minutes long. So some are longer than others. I chose a few r relatively short ones to share with you tonight. Um, and it's interesting; uh, those shots were, of course, right on the right on the Stony Clove, actually, outside of Phoenicia, uh, right near the uh, the old Phoenicia pharmacy. So it's a spot where many of you probably know about. There's a little gazebo there. So it was right on the on the creek bank there. Um, one of the things that we were able to capture is a lot of uh, quite beautiful aerial shots of the creek and of the watershed and of the Hudson. And I have to thank all the uh, aerial videographers who made their work available to us and I'd just like to give you their names. You may know some of them as well. Um, and and uh, so Jeff Baer and Michael Nelson and Vinnie Marano, uh, Dennis Eau Claire, uh, Angel, uh, whose last name forget, I forget already, and Jessica Vecchion uh, helped us out with all these great aerials you'll see throughout the film. Uh, Angel Gates, excuse me, Angel. Uh, so that was one of the things that kind of was, is a standout part of this. And another thing I'd like to mention is the music that we incorporated. Uh, in particular, I'm not showing you a clip tonight uh, that's a little longer about the Ashokan Reservoir. And there was a, a song written by Tim Kaplock. Some of you may know him from the uh, local bluegrass scene, a very talented songwriter and musician, lives in Shokan. And he wrote a, a tune called Behind the Shokan Dam, which kind of tells the story of the land taking and the uh, the history of of the Ashokan Reservoir being built. So it's it's uh, quite an intriguing uh, view. Uh, I know there are still some very strong feelings about the Ashokan, uh, which, of course, is 100 years old now, uh, more than that. So. Um, that's the story about that, Mark. I don't know if you want to talk at all about any of the other music. Uh, I'll just briefly mention we we were lucky to have music by Artie, late Artie Traum and with Jay uh, Unger and Molly Mason, as well as Tim. Uh, and uh, Tim played some original music throughout the film uh, as well. And Mark uh, needs to be unmuted. If we can. No, nope. no such luck. There it is. There yeah. Um, yeah, I think <laughs> I felt the music is one of the best parts of the uh, whole documentary. And I have to credit Toby for do doing a masterful job of fitting uh, some really great, talented music uh, in with the visuals and with the stills. Uh, I think it's something that really sets the rhythm uh, for the visuals and uh, really moves the project along. Special thanks to the uh, music contributors. Um, as you all know, uh, 
you know, these mountains are just a hotbed of musical talent. And we were fortunate enough to uh, capture some of that in a bottle, I thought. I, I really think that's one of the uh, best, most fun parts of, of the documentary. And uh, I was discussing with Toby earlier today the uh, um, song you mentioned by uh, Tim, uh, Nine Towns Drown Beneath the Shokin Dam. Uh, it was, I, I think, one of the most dramatic, historic uh, presentations of the, the whole project. So if you do buy the DVD, especially check that out. Uh, a lot of tasty photography, a lot of, of tasty contemporary photography also about the, <clears throat> the Shokin um, Reservoir. And if you spend any time there, like I have lately uh, fishing it or just hiking it, uh, it's really one of the most beautiful places in the Casco Mountains, especially around a uh, warm sunset. I'd highly recommend it. Right, good. Uh, the other thing I'll mention is um, we get a lot of help I can't make these uh, documentaries about the local uh, history without a lot of help from organizations like the Historical Society of Woodstock and other local history societies and libraries, uh, collectors who share their, their uh, postcards or their vintage photographs with us. Uh, and uh, libraries, of course, uh, and a lot of anglers. We put on a call for some of the uh, quote unquote, best catches. Uh, and we got some great uh, photographs that people shared with us and they're, they're part of the film as well. Uh, we ran into people who were visiting from Ohio who were willing to share this story and uh, uh, um, a young woman telling us about how they've been here for two days and her husband had caught 10 fish. So the kid speaks to the, uh, the amount of uh, of good fishing available on the upper Asopus and really throughout the watershed. Lower Asopus has its own uh, fishery, which is a very different uh, kind than the trout fishery uh, up in the upper, uh, beyond, above the uh, Ashokan, if you will. Uh, so let's, let's do another clip here and we'll keep moving this right along. Come on. Speaking of fishing. From the beginning of May, I used to be up in Phoenicia roaming the trout streets. My grandmother had a boarding house and it was all food on a table. And in those days, like in Phoenicia, there was no place to buy food. You could buy beer, you could buy fishing gear at Folkets, or there was a gas station, cars, you know, car lot there. But there was no food stores. So everybody up here in those days fished. Everybody was a fisherman and a hunter. The really good ones, and they were all good at different types of fishing, you know. They had a reputation, and everybody knew them. They were like people that talked about. They were like famous up here. So all summer, it was all people out of New York City would come up, just mostly guys, sometimes their wives would come up. Every morning for breakfast, they ate trout, pancakes, bacon, and eggs. And all the trout was fried in bacon grease. That was the best. So it was my job to go out and catch the trout. So I fished every day. I wasn't a big trout eater, but I caught trout every single day, you know. And if you do something every day, you get to be pretty good at it. You learn. You know, after a while, you can look at the water. You know where the fish are just by looking because you've seen it a million times. So there you go. That's uh, one fisherman's uh, story. Uh, Steve uh, is uh, still in the Colonial Inn. If you get a chance to visit him, I'm sure he has a, a story to tell you. Mark, you look like you want to say something. Yeah, well, first of all, let's point out that that young blonde child that was in that clip is the same person as the older Steve Whitty we saw. So that's a lifetime of fly fishing. Uh, well, he wasn't always necessarily fly fishing, but a lifetime of fishing in the Asopus Creek. Also, let me point out those big stringers of uh, huge trout that he's holding up, those huge brown trout. We never, ever see a catch like that on the Asopus Creek these days. And one thing you constantly hear from these old timers, Toby mentioned um, the uh, president of our local Trout Unlimited chapter. We have members that were fishing this creek in the 1950s before I was born. And we constantly hear, oh my gosh, you should have been here in the 50s. You should have been here in the 60s. You should have been here yesterday. 
Um, but that's an historical uh, fact about the uh, all, all these trout fisheries is that the uh, fishing scene was way, way different uh, back in the day. And th this is something like, like everything else in society, like everything else in our world is, is changing and morphing and constantly adjusting. And that's one of the interesting things about, about fly fishing, about following the sport, about being a guide is how this really deep, deep historical imperative is continually evolving as our society evolves along with it. Okay. Uh, Mark, you mentioned a little bit about the history of, uh, of dry fly fishing and how that grew up in this area. Uh, do you want to elaborate a little bit on that? Uh, yeah, there was, I mean, we, we can't say this is the first uh, place ever fly fish in America, but we can say that a lot of the uh, fly uh, patterns, the fly designs used all around the world today were originated on these waters, on the Sopus Creek and these other uh, Catskill waters. A lot of the uh, tackle, uh, use the tackle designs, the techniques were developed. Um, the very first true accurate entomology, because when we fly fish, we're basically uh, imitating the insects that live in the water, the aquatic insects. It, these aren't house flies, these are actual aqu aquatic insects. So the first accurate entomological study was um, done on the Sopus Creek, Preston Jennings, uh, published 1933, I think, Derry Dale Press, uh, called the uh, uh, Book of Trout Flies. Uh, and that was researched on what's today called the Preston Jennings Pool, uh, which is in Mount Tramper, just below where they just took out the antique iron bridge, if anybody's following that. Um, so yeah, we have a deep reservoir of, of, uh, of history and um, uh, for example, at the Phoenicia Library, we have a collection of, uh, I think, 65 flies that we put together in two big uh, 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 shadow boxes of uh, the actual flies that were developed on the Sopus Creek or heavily used on the Sopus Creek, made popular on the Sopus Creek, highly productive on the Sopus Creek. So uh, we do have an archive of this if anybody wants to check out the Phoenicia Library. Unfortunately, we can't enter the library now until our current crisis is over, but one day we will be able to. Um, so yeah, there's a tremendous amount of reference and resource material that Toby and I were, were able to access to put the, put this video together. Great. Uh, well, Ginny and I just asked me a question in the came out of the chat room uh, about uh, whether or not there were any paddling experiences. And it just so happens that the next clip I have is about kayaking uh, and the uh, a sort of slalom that that's held or has been held every every year in the fall. Um, so why don't we go right to that? Maybe that'll answer the questions. Kayaking is usually four weekends a year, if that, and, it's, and New York State looks at the availability of cold water. If there's not enough cold water, they deny those events, so they don't jeopardize the cold water, right? And so it's four weekends a year, right? So you got to be aware when they are. Although this, the last release, which is usually in October, can generate a false run of sporting trout out of the Ashokan Reservoir, larger fish that are in the Ashokan Reservoir run up into the Asopus Creek and spawn. So that last release can bring some big fish into the Ashokan early during trout season. As for tubing, most tubers are, I think, are out there after 9, 10 o'clock and gone by 4, all right? And they're only in a small section of the river. They're usually after Memorial Day and gone by Labor Day. And mostly you see them in July and August. And the best time of day to fish in July and August is not between 9 and 4. So if you're fishing the best time of day, it should be minimal impact. It really should be. I'm fishing, I'm fishing, I'm fishing, I'm fishing. I'm fishing! But I have four kids, and I thought they would enjoy being out here doing something that they've never done before. So, and I would have to say that I did well because I had three out of my four kids have already gotten a fish. So it's exciting, and I've never done it, so I'm going to do it shortly, I hope. <laughs> Do you want to reel this in, see if you've got a fish? I don't think you've got a bite yet.
A. Okay, so that's a, a little bit about recreation. Other than fishing, of course, a lot of people do hiking along along the banks as well. Uh, so there are a lot of opportunities for recreation. There's a whole other section that talks about the portal, which is kind of mentioned obliquely in that last section, uh, which is the uh, the uh, intake uh, that uh, comes from the Skahari Reservoir through an 18-mile underground tunnel. Uh, it empties out into the Esopus. Uh, I've just been recently reading something about I know they're continuing to work on the on the portal and on the on the Skahari Reservoir in general, uh, and I know that's affected uh, releases. Uh, Mark, I don't know if there's any latest on on what's going on with uh, with the portal. Yeah, so the issue is that in the Skahari Reservoir, there's a big intake tower uh, where they let water in, and then it goes into the <clears throat> underground tunnel. I believe that's Rose Mountain, uh, and then comes out of the portal in the, in the Sopus Creek and. Uh, I think there were four gates, three of them were rusted and inactive. Uh, so they wanted to um, further enable the ability to how much they can control the water release from the Schoharie Res into the portal and then into the, uh, uh, into the Sopus Creek and then the Ashokan Reservoir. And uh, this is all underwater work. These are underwater divers. So what they've done is they have put a big plug uh, in the portal so the divers don't get sucked into the uh, tunnel as they're working. But um, recent conditions have created a great deal of turbulence around that construction area. So they had to um, halt construction for a while. Um, so consequently, there hasn't been any uh, recent releases from the portal into the Sopus Creek, which is OK, because we just had a whole lot of heavy rain to uh, help fill up these reservoirs. Um, but that's the crux of it. They are repairing. The intake valves at in the so uh, in the, in the Skahari Reservoir, and they will also be um, instituting a um, an innovation, which is going to be a long uh, spout. They can be lowered deeper into the water to withdraw co colder water uh, than they have been in the past. And the issue there is that the trout need uh, cold water for healthy trout propagation. They're a cold water species. Once the water gets above around seventy degrees, it doesn't contain enough dissolved oxygen for healthy trout propagation. So if they release the water from the Skoharie Res uh, as a mindful of the cold water regimen in the Esopus Creek, then the Esopus Creek below the portal will remain a cold water trout refugia the entire summer, even in these hot late July, August, early September months, which is one of the things that makes the Esopus Creek such a prime world-class trout fishery. We have cold water, if managed correctly, if managed correctly year round, um, fortunately, through the um, through the efforts of our Trout Unlimited Conservation Group um, and others, the angling community, um, the whitewater recreation community, um, we have been getting a great deal more cooperation, we feel, from the New York City DEP in that regard, uh, managing the flows from the, from the Skahari Reservoir into the Sopus Creek for trout-friendly management. That didn't used to happen all the time. And in fact, uh, some of these issues were alluded to by some of the speakers in the film about how the way it used to be back in the day. Um, but now, um, I, I think the DEP, first of all, they recognize the, the, uh, the recreational value of this trout fishery. Uh, and this is Sopus Creek. We do consider this the lifeblood of our economy flowing through going through Shandaken and, and Olive in these townships. Uh, and DEP has shown a wider recognition of that. And uh, to my mind, way more cooperation than what was maybe experienced 20 or 30 years ago. Uh, we still hear a lot of uh, bad mouthing and a lot of uh, you know, negativity about the DEP and how they manage the land around here. But uh, I think we are seeing a lot more cooperation. And um, we will also, in 2021, is going to start a whole new um, um, regimen of trout management regulations that the state is putting in place. Um, the current trout management regulations have been in place for about 30 years. And as I mentioned, the angling community is changing, the fishery is changing. So in 2021, there will be some new changes, including the fact that they won't be stocking the Sopus Creek prior, uh, up until this year, the Sopus Creek was one of the most heavily stocked trout fisheries in the state, meaning that the state would raise trout in, in pens, in, in hatcheries, and then transplant those fish into the river so anglers could catch them. 
uh, they won't be happening anymore. We will be reverting to a total wild trout fishery managed for wild trout. Um, so this is going to be a grand experiment in fisheries management. Uh, we think it'll take a couple of years for this trout, the wild trout population to uh, supersede the amount of fish that we could ever stock as, as, uh, as, as hatchery fish. Um, so there are big changes afoot for, for the Sophus Creek and, and, and the fishery. So what that means is our film is already obsolete because we have a whole great section on stocking trout. And if it, uh, we didn't mention that, it might come to an end. So uh, be aware that that's a change that's coming up. Well, it is an historical documentary. So that, that is part of our history. So, uh, and we documented it. <laughs> right, indeed. Uh, and as we learned, there's a lot more to the creek than just the fishery. And certainly there's the clean water requirement for the Ashokan Reservoir, but then below the Ashokan called the Lower Asopus, which is, is interesting because the Ashokan Reservoir is right in the middle of the watershed. And as, as is explained in the, in the film, most or many reservoirs that are in different watersheds around the world are in the, the upper regions of that watershed. The Shokan is a little different. It's right in the middle. So there are about 30 miles or 32 miles of, of creek uh, above, if you will, the Shokan, and another 32 miles or so below it, winding its way through uh, some nice uh, gorges. Uh, the Shokan Center Campus uh, has a great gorge that the, the water flows through. We've got a mark catching a nice trout down in there, which is a beautiful scene. Uh, and then it continues on to the uh, Hurley Flats, which is uh, the remnants of, an, well, it is an alluvial plain, so they're great, rich uh, soils that washed down from the mountains at, over, over, the, uh, over the centuries, and over the millennia. Uh, and uh, from there, it continues on through several towns, including through Kingston. So it has an urban edge to it as well, which needs to be maintained. And Mary McNamara, who's one of the great uh, saviors of the creek, uh, talks to us about that and about management issues on the lower sopus and how the uh, importance of keeping the upper sopus clean affects not only the drinking water, but what goes on in the lower sopus as the creek makes its way all the way to Saugerties. So it's a 65 mile uh, journey for the water. And uh, there's, as I mentioned, a great fishery below the, uh, in the lower part of the Sopus around Saugerties, a warm water fishery. And we have some great uh, footage with uh, uh, Bobby Taylor took it, uh, us out on his boat. We actually ended up going uh, striped bass fishing uh, with him, but there's only just one little, one little shot of the, of the bass when we're talking about the fishery itself. So uh, we had a lot of great adventures, and Bobby was very generous with his time as well. Uh, I have a, a clip I can show you which deals a little bit with Saugerties. Of course, there was a lot of industry up and down the creek, a lot of mills, any place anyone thought they could dam up the stream to some advantage to run a water-powered machinery. That happened a lot of places. There were tanneries, of course, uh, in uh in Woodland Valley, uh, in other places along the creek. Those are, of course, long gone. Uh, there was a great water power driven industry in Saugerties at the Cantine Dam site. Uh, and there was, uh, it had a long, uh, very kind of glorious uh, history of uh, early industrial American Revolution, which is also reflected in the film. Uh, Mark, anything you want to say before I show this clip? Oh, uh, no, just other than um, a lot of the uh, information we uncovered is really a surprise to me. I had no idea that how uh, rich the industrial history of uh, Saugerties was. So one of the more interesting aspects of the film for me. Great. So let's let's show this one.
part of the reason that Socrates is such a vibrant community is that the waterfalls of the Esopus gave it power to operate some of the earliest industry in our area. It also provides a beautiful harbor down below. The Hudson River has an estuary that uh, deltas out from the Esopus Creek. The Esopus Creek drops about 20 feet, right maybe about a mile in from the channel of the Hudson River, and there's a dam built on top of it where they developed industrial use very early, early industrial revolution, because the Esopus drains the whole eastern escarpment of the Catskill Mountains, and that's a lot of water, and that's a lot of head, you know, like filling of a mill pond. So once you dam that up, you can run a whole lot of horsepower on water wheels. Henry Barclay and Robert Livingston were friendly and they went up to Albany to see the opening of the Erie Canal. And I imagine they were sitting across the river at Livingston's estate having afternoon tea or something and watching the Esopus pour into the Hudson and Henry saying something like, Robert, what are you doing with all of that water power? And Robert's renting some water power to a couple of mills, and he's happy with that. And he says, but well, you could build a whole industrial water-powered park right here. About 1825, and he built the ironworks first, and then he built the, the paper mill, and then he was advertising all along. Lots of water power come up here, not unlike the IBM film, Come Join IBM in Kingston, only in print. The first iron mill didn't work out so well, and Henry Barclay hired a real guy who was into puddling and double puddling. That was an improvement on the process that made it actually cheaper. He brought in a couple of Fordreniers, which were automated paper making machines. So this is the beginning here and elsewhere, the beginning of the American Industrial Revolution, right here. It's water power. Yeah. All yeah. water power. It's all free. If you think that steam had already been invented and was in use, but it was still the early days by 1825, and of course expensive, and coal was very expensive until the Delaware and Hudson Canal finally made it out to the Poconos, but still, it was black diamonds. It was expensive. Cantine's mill was originally hand cranked, and then it was electrified. They had their own turbines and generators, a below house and a wheelhouse, and they made electricity and just kept on getting bigger and bigger. And of course, they had a little bit of a steam plant to uh, dry the paper, and eventually, of course, the steam plant got bigger and bigger, especially after Shokan was built because the water was limited now, it was being throttled back. So electricity made more sense. So there you go. We made it to Socrates. Um, I'm not sure what else I can tell you other than uh, I'll be happy to try to answer some of your questions if Janine has some things she'd like to pose to us. Let's see. There's a chat here. Let's see. All right. Let's see. Where am I? There I am. There you are. Now you see me, now you don't. <laughs> uh, at the moment, uh, the, the one question that we had, you did answer. Um, and I, 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 you know, I've got to just, while people are thinking, see what comes up, I would say that, you know, everyone that lives in the Hudson Valley at some point has a relationship with the Esopus Creek. And um, thank you for, I mean, I'm, you know, we're always learning about the Esopus. Um, uh, you know, I've been on it in a tube. I've been on it in Socrates in a kayak. I'm sure many people have done that. Sat on the edge, uh, looked at it as it goes into the Ashokan Reservoir. Um, and it's fascinating what, the different lives that it has from wilderness to industry in Socrates and, and all along. So um, I appreciate this little bit that I've learned about that I know my kids have been involved in the stream releases. We've seen 
those things happen, helps them learn about conservation and the importance of clean water. So um, I think that it's, I, I expect it's a fascinating documentary and I can't wait to see the whole thing in its entirety. Uh, it doesn't at the moment look like there's any more questions being put into the chat. Uh, Toby, did you have anything you wanted to add as? Yeah, yeah, I mean, you brought up, uh, so, well, it's, what you said reminded me to let the folks know that we have a section or more than one section actually with Evan Pritchard, who's very knowledgeable about uh, Native American populations in the area, the Lenape, and um, he kind of ties it together in terms of, of bringing up the moral imperative of, of uh, keeping the, the creek clean and caring for our environment uh, in a very kind of poignant way. Uh, so I think that's a, a big addition to it, uh, as well as talking about the, the more recent history. Did you, um, th there was one question that came through that's a good question. Uh, and had you featured anything about the water power that might have, that was taking place uh, in Wittenberg uh, on the Little Beaver Kill as it flows or? Yeah, uh, we, of course we, I'm sure we missed things. We tried to reflect the variety of activities and we did talk about water power. We talked about the, um, the tannery that was in Woodland Valley. Um, and we talk in kind of detail about the industrial water power uses at what's now the Ashokan Center, where there was a dam built, a bluestone, well, first a wooden dam, then eventually a bluestone dam. And there was a mill there, a grist mill, uh, and um, a, uh, a, pay, uh, a pulp mill where they made pulp out of logs that were brought down. And that site was eventually bought by DuPont Company, and they made uh, pulp uh, wood products um, that were used to pack dynamite. Mm -hmm. So it has a, had a real industrial base along that part of the Esopus, have, are initially uh, powered by water. Water, it, 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 we don't, you know, you can't take it for granted. It is a very powerful medium. Um, speaking of powerful water, flooding in Boyceville, did that come up at all in your documentary? Well, what came up, yes, we have a, a section on, uh, again, uh, talking about turbidity and about the power of water, where uh, Ryan Lennox, one of the local uh, videographers, uh, gave us some tremendous footage of Hurricane Irene as it came through uh, Phoenicia. So you get a very clear picture of the power of the Esopus when it, uh, when it over, overflows its banks and goes right through the center of town. And we, I, I can still see that water coming down there under the Cold Brook Road Bridge. <laughs> yeah. Oh my God. Right. <laughs> Let me see, there's one other, there's a thank you. Um, you know, there's a couple of thank yous coming in. Uh, uh, glad to hear uh, about the progress that has been made. So uh, as far as, let's see, the water quality and the lower SOPUS, how has it changed over the past 50 to 70 years? Well, I can't speak for all of that time, but I can tell you that the water quality in the lower SOPUS has improved. Uh, uh, again, Mary McNamara talks to this quite extensively. Uh, there was a group formed to help, uh, help really push forward the idea that the DEP not only had to manage the upper Asopus and what goes into the Ashokan, but the water releases that they do from the Ashokan into the lower Asopus. Mm -hmm. And that had to be really monitored more closely. The turbidity had to be dealt with. Uh, and those things have improved. Uh, I can't give you a quantitative uh, view uh, or idea of that, but I know Mary was, was uh, quite pleased that uh, improvements have been made. There's a water release protocol now that will be in place, which will help manage all of that. So it's it's a better better situation all around. I can Mark, jump anything you remember? Yeah, I can jump on that, that as well. The um, the I guess five seven years ago, the turbidity was really bad. Uh, before, for example, they started doing all this work on the Stony Cove Creek. And uh, we had a series of heavy weather events. I mean, Hurricane Irene was just one of a series actually in that period uh, that drove a great deal of turbidity into the Ashokan Reservoir. And that was the point at which um, the Federal Environmental Protection Agency said in New York City, 
we're not going to award you the uh, filtration avoidance determination unless you do something to clean up the turbidity in the Esopus Creek. These, these fads, filtration, filtration avoidance determinations are typically offered uh, for five year periods. I mentioned there were five municipalities in the country that have this fad. Um, Mayor Bloomberg lobbied the EPA to extend the New York City fad to 10 years. And we've had a succession of 10 year fads uh, on the, um, with the stipulation that New York City do something to um, protect the, or, or uh, diminish the turbidity in the Sopus Creek. And what they did was they created the Ashokan Watershed Stream Management Program. And this is a program that's uh, um, it, it basically administered through um, Cornell University and Cornell Cooperative Extension. But um, they funnel, um, I can't give the exact figure, but there's somewhere, um, they, it's, it's uh, I think for every two, two and a half years, it's about a $2 million expenditure. And uh, I'm, I happen to be on the, uh, uh, the, uh, the budget committee for, for um, that program as well. And I think for uh, every 12 year period, we spend uh, somewhere around a million to maybe a million, a quarter, a million and a half uh, dollars. Um, and we uh, take applications from municipalities, uh, groups, um, interested parties, uh, mostly um, municipal highway groups, for example, to improve the functioning of highway culverts, for example, uh, to rebuild uh, roadways that um, uh, have been washed out by flooding and to generally improve the flood resiliency of the Sopus watershed and also the, uh, the turbidity load of the, of the watershed. Mm -hmm. And this, this program has been online for gosh, seven, eight years now, maybe 10 years. Um, so there has been a tremendous expenditure in, in dollars, primarily from New York City, uh, partially the Fed, partially the state, primarily New York City, um, specifically to address those issues, to, to maintain water quality and uh, healthy hydro, hydro geomorphic functioning of the watershed. So yeah, there has been a lot of effort, a lot of money. And I would say from my point of view, as a fly fisherman, as a resident who looks out on these waters every day, uh, there has been a great deal of improvement over the years. Mm. Mark, are you uh, or Toby able to tell us anything about the decision to stop stocking um, the trout in the fish uh, on the Azokas? Uh Yes, that, 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 there's been there's been a demographic shift in in the angling community. I, I see this as a guide. Mm. Um, also, first of all, let me say the Sopus Creek has been slammed this year. I mean, everybody agrees this is the heaviest use year we've ever seen on the Sopus. I've been fishing these waters for 20, 22 years. Um, absolutely the heaviest use. It's not all fishermen. Um, in fact, it's probably mostly not fishermen at this point. It's people who just want to get outdoors and, um, you know, escape the, the COVID uh, hangover. So what happened this year is all our kind of our secret fly fishing holes that only fly fishermen uh, knew about, well, they are now public fishing holes that everybody knows about. Um, so that points to the heavy use of river is, is, is undergoing. That presents its own challenges um, because be careful what you wish for. And the, you know, it is possible to love these resources too much. But the upshot is that the, the angling community is changing. More younger people are coming in, more females are coming in. Um, we're seeing more children, for example, um, and the sentiment uh, and, and the, the uh, New York State Department of Environmental Conservation uh, did, uh, I guess, about a year long uh, public uh, intake. They had uh, several uh, public hearings around the state, uh, which we weighed in on, and they deduced that the general sentiment within the angling community is a preference to fish for wild trout, to fish over wild trout, to fish for wild trout fishery as opposed to stocking. So we now have um, reliable data from all around the country actually, but especially certain places on the East Coast that have undergone this, this process and have stopped stocking in a healthy, viable wild trout fishery. And then what we found, we have good evidence now, um, good scientific evidence that eventually the wild trout fishery will supersede anything you can put in from stocking. And that's what we're expecting to happen on the Asopus Creek. The fishing pressure notwithstanding, that'll be an issue in these upcoming years um, because uh, the pressure this year was just off the charts. Um, 
So yeah, it's a grand experiment. But I really feel that the 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 heavy use that the Esopus, the attention of Esopus is getting, really bespeaks to what an important important cultural uh, 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 resource this is, um, um, environmental resource, wilderness resource, cultural resource, economic resource. This is not to just our community, but really, <laughs> what we found this year, the entire Northeast, and um, also I think bespeaks of the just the magic of flowing water. They can, we've got many magic days out there. Toby, do you have anything to add? I like I liked that wrap up the um, magic of flowing water. Um, let's see. I think that um, the questions seem to have slowed up a little bit. So if, if it, uh, Toby or Mark don't have anything to um, are finished with their presentation. I would take the opportunity at this moment to thank everyone for attending. Um, please thank visit you. our website if you are able to, to consider becoming a member of the Historical Society of Woodstock uh, and shopping our virtual gift shop. I did want to thank Weston for organizing with Toby Carey this presentation. Yes, you can ask a question. Go ahead. Um, I'm ready for it. One final question. How's that sound? Sounds good. Okay. I think it's coming, maybe. Um, well, the question is, what we did answer the, the reason for the cessation of stocking fish. Uh, it, there was a study done that was done for a year or so um, to research if that should be done. It was the changing of the demographics of the fishermen, more women, more children. Uh, are involved, there's more people fishing and the studies showed that the um, people, correct me if I'm wrong, um, the, the, the wild trout will take over and there is not a need for commercial stocking of the Soaps Creek anymore. That's been shown by data that other communities that have done the same thing. Is that correct, Mark? Yes, that's correct. Well, okay. also the fact that there, there is a market preference, a market ex express preference within the angling community to be fishing for wild fish. They're more difficult to catch, but but they're wild. <laughs> and I, I think that makes sense to me. I'm not a fishing person at all, but I do know folks that fish and that does make sense. So um, thank you for following up on that with that answer. And in closing, uh, Richard Hefner, I wanna thank Richard and, and Michael Drillinger for working in the background and assisting on the Zoom process. Um, we are still accepting people uh, invites for tomorrow's presentation by Will Nixon, who will be on hand at three o'clock to discuss the pocket guide to Woodstock. He has completely revised his popular 2012 guide, which does include a walking tour of the historic village of Woodstock. And so with that note, I would bid everyone adieu um, until we meet again. And thank you all for attending. And thank you. Take care. Thanks for having us. Thank you. Bye -bye. Thank you. Thank you, Toby. You're welcome. Thank you, Mark. See you around. Mm -hmm.